is going to be a healing story folded within a generational story, as you will note. And it's a long-term process, uh, which is something that's, um, that happens when people are older. They recognize long-term processes in their life, which is why these kinds of stories are so valuable to younger people, especially to realize that you know life isn't just flooding by with no meaning. Uh, the meaning sometimes comes much, much later, and then it keeps on evolving. Okay. <clears throat> This begins at the University of Colorado when I was a summer school student and uh, met a man, a young man, who I happened to go to school with in Washington, D.C. at Catholic University. And it was kind of amazing because we had met before, but very briefly, and I won't go into that whole story, but it was, it was significant, the original meeting for me. I don't think it was for him or he didn't know it was. And so when I met him again, it was at a bar in Boulder, Colorado, uh, the very first night I was there. And because we uh, met each other in Washington, D.C., he invited me out. So that's how it started. And the two of us were, uh, became quickly a couple. So by the time we uh, went back to Catholic University, I was already pinned to him. There's another story threaded through here uh, of another boyfriend, uh, which I ended up marrying later. Uh, but I'm not going to tell that story now. Uh, at any rate, so we were pinned, and um, I was a good Catholic girl, so of course I wasn't going to um, have sex with him. And uh, then we went to Catholic. Then we went back to Colorado the next summer for summer school again, and this time we had sex once, okay, once, and I got pregnant, or I. Th thought I got pregnant. I wasn't sure. I didn't get my period. But I was too embarrassed to go to the doctor to find out if I was pregnant. So that's where I come from, this incredibly saintly Catholic childhood, full of guilt, shame, um, you know, judgments, um, obedience, uh, rules, regulations, and so forth. So rather than finding out whether I was really pregnant and enduring the shame of knowing that I was, we got married. So there I was, married at 20, and then it turns out I was pregnant. But it, I might have gotten pregnant right away as soon as we got married. I wasn't sure. And, uh, but at any rate, so my, my first son, Sean, was born nine months after we were married. So I still don't know if I was pregnant or not. Um, the doctor said he would be coming in April. He actually came in May. I was so grateful to him because April would have been only eight months. I mean, you see what I'm talking about? I'm talking about these, these patterns of um, not being true to yourself, which start out with these religious stri strictures, which I was raised with. Okay, so we're married. We have one child, then we have another child. Um, he's a student uh, at Harvard at, in, in architecture uh, now, and I'm miserable because I'm a mother. I didn't want to be a mother. I'd always mothered my own mother's children because I was the oldest of eight and I needed to be free, but I was saddled with responsibility and these two children and this husband who was very narcissistic. And the reason that he attracted me in the first place was he was very talented and very um, creative and very inventive. And so when I look back on that, I would say that he was a projection of that part of myself that was no, not yet visible. Okay, finally. After six years, I, you know, the, the feminist movement had kicked in uh, with us on the East Coast anyway, and I finally uh, said, no, we can't do this anymore, which really annoyed him, of course. And I kicked him out of the house, and then I had the children for two more years until I went to New College of California, where I was going to be a teacher there. I wanted to take the kids with me, but he refused and said he'd take us to court if if I did that and I didn't want to put the kids through that, so I agreed, okay, I'll take the kids in the summer, you take them the rest of the time. So that decision to leave my children was the most, um, I would say, the most karmic thing I've ever done. And of course it is very karmic. And it weighed on me, as you can imagine, for all those years. I mean, even though they, I saw them in the summer, 
And then when they were 12 and 15, uh, I told them they didn't have to go back to him. They could stay with me. Uh, and then he found out that I'd said that, and then he insisted they come back or they, he'd send the U.S. Marshal out after us. <laughs> and so they went back, and then he said to me that he would never let them see me again or even talk to me again. So I went through six years of complete um, absence with my children. Uh, and it was, it was, of course, the thing that was in the back of my mind, it was in the back of my heart, it was in the back of my emotions the entire time. Okay, so this brings us up to 1987. And by the way, before that, for about, about that same six years, I was working on what I call now, and I will tell a story about that, my own inner child work. In other words, working on healing the little kid in me who had been abandoned emotionally by her mother, not through any fault of her own, and that's another story. But anyway, abandoned by her mother, so I was unable to mother. It was like um, it carried through to, a gener to the next generation, in other words. And uh, I started to recognize that, and so I knew I had to heal my own inner child, my own, the, the little girl that I called Orphan Annie. And I did that, especially utilizing the book, um, what's it called? Um, Drama of a Gifted Child, Drama of the Gifted Child, and it's about German child raising. And that's certainly my parents are German. So at any rate, I went through many years of doing this inner work, uh, working both with journals, with um, uh, Jung's books, also especially Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, and um, my own dreams, and my friend Claudia, who we co-counseled each other in doing this kind of work. Okay, so now let's go back to 1987, and now I want to go to August 1987, the Harmonic Convergence. Anybody my age will remember this if they spent any time in New Age circles. Um, this was supposedly a date when, and it ended up being the first time on the planet that we ever had a planet-wide uh, ceremony um, of meditation. People were meditating all over the world at all these sacred sites. There was a group of people who came up from California. Uh, 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 I can't remember the woman's name right now, but she had a bunch of followers with her and she invited me to be the astrologer for the occasion. And so this was August 17th, 18th, 2087. So there we were in an enormous yurt, like 20 foot diameter anyway, yurt. And this was the night of the 17th and we were twirling like Sufis and I was twirling like a Sufi. And this is about midnight or 11 o'clock at night or something like that. And I was twirling, just going round and round and round. And all of a sudden I heard a very deep male voice, not for the first time. And I will tell other stories about this, but a deep male voice that said to me, You must finish your personal karma you have till the end of the year. That was it. Oh, no. It was obvious to me what I had to do. I had to go, I mean, even then, it was just obvious to me what that meant. I had to go back and work with the father of my children so that I could see my children again. That's what I had to do. How I was going to do that, I had no idea and I didn't know whether I'd actually do it, you know. It's like, but then a couple of weeks later, I was with a friend, an old friend, who had children my age, my kids' age, and our kids had gotten together in the summer times, and I told her about what had happened to me in the, in the ceremonial yurt, and she said, oh, wow. And then I said, you know, I wonder if my mother would come with me. And she went, oh, that's a fabulous idea. But I went, oh no, that couldn't be. Because my mother had never done anything so brave. And it would be very brave to go back and see Patrick after all these years of such animosity between us. I like to think of it as animosity from him to me, but actually I had the same feeling towards him that he had towards me, of utter frozen hatred. Both blaming each other for what had happened and there were the kids, you know, in the middle of it. Okay, so, okay, I'm gonna do it. I decided I'd go back 
at, at uh, Thanksgiving to see him. And hopefully in seeing him, I will be able to then get back together with my kids who remember I hadn't been with for six years. Okay, I called upon a friend in Cambridge uh, who I'd known back then, who knew me when my kids were very, very small, and she got a hold of Sean. She was able to get a hold of the oldest one, who came over to her house and they had dinner together, and she showed him pictures of when they were small, and he couldn't look at them. And she told me, she said, Anne, he couldn't look at the pictures. It's really hard for him. But what he did do was he went down and found his dad and they went down to Washington, D.C. together. They, they drove down there because Colin was there. Neither one had seen Colin, my second son, for years. They found him, told him about it. So there was something in the air that this was supposed to happen, and even Patrick was aware that this was supposed to happen. So everybody knew that I was now coming at Thanksgiving. But still, for me, it was like, how am I going to do this? Because, I mean, how am I going to do this? And so what I decided to do, and this is probably is the most important point of this whole story, is I decided to give the question, the problem, to my unconscious mind. That my unconscious mind knows so much more than I do. That my little conscious mind is a little tip of an iceberg on top of this giant thing that goes down into the ocean of the collective unconscious. And so I needed to trust that part of myself to be able to handle whatever this was. And what I did was I left it up to my unconscious and then every week, about once a week, I would bring it up, the question up for review. And at first it was, you know, there was still that hatred, that frozen hatred. But gradually I started to notice that the hatred was starting to soften that I was starting to actually feel Patrick, his inner child, the little boy whose father had died when he was five, which was the same time when I left him. <laughs> you know, when Colin was five is when I told him he had to go. So it like, it, my leaving reactivated his early trauma. And he, of course, was unaware of it because he hadn't done this inner child work. I don't think he ever did. He's dead now. And so I started to, it started to, what, what was that like for Patrick? And I started to realize, oh my God, how awful for him. And so my feelings for Patrick started to soften because what I was seeing was not, the person I was seeing was not this frozen soul that, that you know, had frozen into hatred and, and self-righteousness like I had been, but the little kid who's just vulnerable as hell, like we're all little kids originally, and that's what I had done with myself, and now I was able to do it, thank, thanks to the unconscious, with him as well. So by the time I got to Massachusetts, and by the way, I did ask my mother, she did agree to come, and that was really scary too, because I didn't know if she'd do it. And so I was risking rejection both from him and from my mother, and both of them agreed to do this, even though it was a very difficult thing. And she had never done anything, anything having to do with conflict. She's a, um, a Libra. Okay, so we met each other in Denver. She came from Seattle. I came from Jackson. And um, and I said to her, I don't know. You know, on the on the plane ride to Boston, I said, I don't know what's going to happen. I just know I have to do this. And she was like, you know, looked at me like, oh my God. And on the way down in the rental car the next day, I had taken a sleeping pill the night before, by the way, which I never do, but I knew I had to be able to, to be there that day. And on the way down in the rental car, I said, okay, I know how it's going to begin. We, you and me, we're going to go get some wine and some crackers as if this is a, just a, a nice meeting with somebody. We're gonna do this, somehow this is going to help ease the way. And she said, okay. So we went and got the wine and the crackers and came to his little cabin that he lived in on the beach where the kids had been raised with him and his wife who then left him. And he comes out into the porch and he goes, Renee, that's my mother. Hello, he was so glad to see her. He loved the crowd camps. He just didn't like me. 
And then I, then he goes to me, he looks over at me, he says, hello, Anne, <laughs> with that same frozen look. And mother actually got a picture of us there and I'm leaning, I'm leaning away from him like this, you know, and he's like, just like this frozen soul. So we go in and we put the crackers and the wine down on the table, the same table we'd had when the kids were little, a little teak, a teak table. And um, it was really awkward. We didn't know what to do. So we were pulling the, the paper off the crackers and, and pouring the wine. And, and then my unconscious came up and said, Patrick, we're here to talk about whatever you need to talk about. And that began the onslaught that lasted for four hours. And I had to take whatever he was putting out, whatever he was expressing, and pull it from him and let it go internally. Just not take it in, because before that I'd been taking in every time he'd blame me, I was taking it in. I wasn't doing that anymore. I was pulling it through, help, helping him let go of this frozen mass of feelings of blame and judgment. And my mother was sitting there like just, I mean, she was like, oh my God, what is going on? Uh, she, she wasn't saying, I told her, you don't have to say a word. You don't have to say a word. This is going to be him. He needs to be, he needs to be able to let go of this. And I didn't know how it was going to start, but that's how it started. And at one point I remember putting my hand across the table and grabbing his arm and saying, Patrick, we've got to get through this. And his soul for the very first time spoke to mine. He said, Anne, we can't go too fast. So he went right back into it. This constant blame, vituperation. It was just over and over again, blaming me for being a bad mother and leaving them. And one thing after another, I can't even remember it. I just know that there was this huge onslaught of negativity that took four hours for him to let go of. And I had to sit there and help him do it. And then finally, after four hours, my mother stands up and she goes, that's it, I can't take anymore. But he was spent. It was done. I got up and went over to him and hugged him. And this time, it wasn't frozen. He was trembling like a leaf. So I knew that we had shifted the situation and that now I could get back together with my children, which I did over the next few days. And that's another story. I just wanted to tell this part of it to, to say how my most difficult karma that I had created in this life then required a very difficult uh, resolution, which I was able to do thanks to my unconscious. Okay, so fast forward a little ways. Now the kids, have ne they never did process um, their, their feelings about their father. They, he had treated them very badly. He had treated them like his little servants. Um, and that's still to be done, that isn't done. In fact, his, all his paperwork, which he has enormous amounts of, and I would like to organize it and see what's there, but um, they won't let me do it, at least not yet. And uh, here's, here's the, the part I wanted to tell you. The, the, the finale is that my grandchild, Kira, who's now, I think, she's, I think she just turned 19, um, last year she decided she wanted to go to the University of Colorado. She had only met her grandfather once and that's the day she was born her father never let him see her again and she ended up with the same talent the same inventiveness the same creativity and now she is in Colorado at the University in environmental design so she also is becoming an architect so that's how it folds into the generational story. She had no idea that he was at the University of Colorado before that. Uh, and then, so why was she attracted there? And why was she gonna do architecture? It's so fascinating, the mysteries that we live with. So one final little key here is a few years ago, 
a, a psychic called me and she said, I thought I was going to call, call to talk to you about a, a, a um, television program on the crone that I want to do, but really something else has come through me right now. I said, well, what's that? And she said, do you, do you, is your, did the father of your children pass? And I said, yes. And she said, well, he's here and he says to tell you that he's sorry that you were right. That's the end of that story.